Shepherd Ministries. We are, as always, really glad that you're watching these videos. We do have in-person service every Sunday morning. We have midweek services throughout the week. We have a Bible study on Wednesday night, stuff for your kids on Tuesday night, stuff for young adults Monday night. Uh, we're here if you want to be a part. If not, we're just really glad that you're watching these videos. Let's start this morning with some prayer. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for all you're doing. And thank you so much for continuing to forgive us and be patient with us and help us to love people uh, just a little bit better each day than we did before. Please keep us encouraged and keep us strengthened and keep us moving through this life in a way that pleases you and that really brings people uh, to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
talk to you about something that I found really interesting. And what I'm going to do here in a minute is I'm going to put uh, an image up on the screen. And some of you have probably already seen it if you're on Facebook, but I want to put it up and I just want to leave it on the screen for a while and I want you to think about it. This is an image that I promoted on Facebook. Now, when you do a Facebook promotion, you're basically just choosing who in the community, the types of people that you would like to see your post and within how many miles of your location. And so this is something we do from time to time, maybe with kids camp, or maybe when I just, I wanna put something out there and let people know, hey, the church is there, here's something cool that we're doing. But in this case, it wasn't really announcing anything, it was just something that resonated with me. And when I put it up to our church, it, it resonated with some people at our church. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna promote this into the local community around our church within, let's say, 20, 25 miles. I forget what I picked. And I was kind of shocked at what happened because I've, I've posted things before and people like it and share it, uh, you know, 100, maybe 200. But this post got over a 1,000 likes. Uh, it, it got hundreds of shares, uh, which is where people share it to people on their page. It just sort of blew up. And it got me to thinking, what is it about this image and what it says that so resonated with people more than anything else that we've ever kind of put out there publicly? So I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna show it to you. And I just want to make sure, I'm not even gonna make you pause, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it on the screen, there'll be a little timer just counting down to show you how much longer it's gonna be on there. I want you to think about, very simply, why did this resonate with so many people? Why was this something that people gravitated to? And, and why was this something that people just, it really clicked in their brains and, and they really attached to it? Let's try that out.
forgive them even if they're not sorry. What did you come up with? Why do you think that resonated so much with people? For me, and, and my wife and I talked about this and I've talked about it with other people, what, what I kind of came to is the idea that um, this is the thing that people most wish they had from others, that they most wish they saw, and that they most wish they could do. I think, I think people have been hurt so badly by people and then people aren't sorry. And I think there's one thing, I think it's easy to accept a mistake. I think it's easy to accept that, you know, when somebody's done wrong and they apologize, but when they don't apologize, when they're not even sorry, it really, it just doesn't feel right. It feels like uh, an acknowledgement hasn't been made. There isn't an understanding uh, that 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 all of these things are in place. And man, does that upset us and unsettle us. A lot of times we can handle mistakes. We can handle flaws from people. But it's really hard when somebody hurts us. And it's just like they don't even know. And so then what do we do? We spend our time trying to get them to know. We try desperately to wait for them to realize how much they've hurt us or how much they've done something wrong. And, and here's this message that's saying, forgive them even if they don't do that. Because forgiveness is as much for you as it is for them. It frees you of being just imprisoned by this hurt or this offense or this thing that's been done against you. And it's interesting because in, in scripture, we're told that if we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive others, regardless of whether they're sorry or not. It's something where God says, I've forgiven you, so your primary witness, the primary thing I want you to do out in this world is, is to show love and to tell people about Jesus and to forgive them, even when they're not sorry. And so that really requires us to stop and, and kind of think about, is that something that we do? Because in 21st century America, nobody's sorry about anything. You can, you can do just about anything uh, short of a criminal offense, and you don't have to apologize for it. In fact, the more you double down, the more you say, you know, no, it's not something to apologize for. It's something good. It's something right. The more you justify the more you will find a crowd waiting in the wings to support you in that. What a strange time. What a strange time that just going online, we can each be kind of masters of our own worlds. And we can, we can say, you know what, I have a truth and you have a truth. And they may be different truths, but they're all true. It's, it's really, when you think about it, scary. And it's put us in a place where... We don't know how to apologize anymore. We don't know how to say, you know what, I'm sorry, because what we want, what I want, what we want is, is for somebody to realize what they did too. And I'm not sorry. I don't have to be sorry. If I'm sorry, I'm admitting I'm wrong. Am I? Can I just be sorry that someone's feelings got hurt? Can I just be sorry that I said something in a way that, that hurt somebody? Do I have to have everybody understand my position and what I think and all these things for me to treat them well? These, I think, are things that, that really, I think they sit in people's minds and I think they bother people. And I think churches do it all the time. I think we burn through people. I think we hurt people. I think... Sometimes we're so concerned with the business of doing church that we forget what the church is really supposed to be about. And so let me ask you this question. I'm going to put this on the screen too. Who's the church for? Is it for... Just, just think of the church you go to or our church or whichever church you can think of. What, who's that church for? Is it for new people? Is it for... Uh, you know, people that have been there a long time? Is it for the community? Is it for good works? Is it for missions? Is it for getting the gospel out into the world? Like what kind of people? Who is the church for? 
who is the church down the street for? You know, think of a couple of different churches. Um, different churches seem to be set up for different people. They have different flavors. They have different preferences, sometimes different theology, uh, different doctrines. But, but for the most part, churches are set up for a certain kind of, of person. Who's our church set up for? Who is our church meant for? Who's your church meant for? Who's churches in, in your area? Who are they meant for? Think about it. Here's, here's the biggest issue. Churches aren't meant for people. Churches were designed, churches were built, churches should function and operate for Jesus Christ. And so if there is a church in the inner city and it operates for the people of that inner city, that may be good, that may not be so good. But if it operates for Jesus Christ, now it operates exactly for the people that God wants to bring to that church and use that church to reach. Got a church way out in the country. Who's that church for? If that church is for Jesus Christ, it accomplishes the same thing. Because while it may be for different people or different kinds of people or from different fields or careers or all these things, it's, it's for whoever God says it's for. Because that church is for Jesus Christ. Is our church for Jesus Christ? Is your church for Jesus Christ? Are churches for Jesus Christ? Because if they were, I wonder whether people would get so hurt at them. You may have noticed people bouncing from church to church. Uh, that's because churches hurt, whether they mean to or not. They burn you, and they don't have a lot of, of reason to, to try to keep you, and, and you don't have a lot of reason to stay because there's 80 other churches you can find. And I'm not saying moving to a different church is bad. It's just, when did we lose relationship? When did we lose the, you know what, your family, and I'm, I'm going to figure this one out. And I, again, I understand there's some situations. Sometimes a church or a, or a pastor has hurt somebody so bad, you should get out of there. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to say, you know, if a church is, is not looking out for you, uh, just tough it out, kid. I'm talking about you and me. I'm talking about us, the individuals, when we get hurt. And we just, we really want people to be sorry. And when they're not, now we're left with this, ugh, that we've got to do something with. And what does the Bible tell us to do? It tells us to forgive them even if they're not sorry. It doesn't mean we have to stick around. It doesn't mean you have to be somebody's best friend uh, when, you, when you love your enemy or you love somebody that's hurt you. It means that you are going to free yourself from also being a part of whatever sin hurt you. Not only am I not going to respond, not only am I not going to hit back or talk back or, or abuse back, I'm going to go even further. I'm going to forgive that other person. So that in my heart, I can go on, I can move on, I can, I can live my life. Maybe it's a different place, a different church, but I can, I can forgive that. I can let it go. Because when I don't forgive, what happens? Lies, gossip, slander, uh, Church becomes social clubs, and we pit my social club versus your social club, and our social club versus the social club down the street. And, uh, you know, who, who does your social club attract? What kind of people do you have at your social club? And see, then a church is not for Jesus. The minute we stop forgiving people, even when they're not so sorry, our churches become maybe full of people, but they're empty of the spirit because we're not we're not creating a family of believers and assembling a family of believers that are doing any better than the rest of the world i want to read you a passage from luke chapter 7. i love this passage it pits people in the community uh versus jesus versus the the kind of religious elite versus uh, just there's, there's a lot going on in this story. 
And what you'll notice is um, everyone in this story has a different point of view. And what Jesus teaches out of this story is something that is profound. And I think something that, that we really need to latch on to. So Luke chapter 7, turn there with me, please. Verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she bought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. This is amazing. So let's set the story. Here's this woman, and she is just known to be immoral. Whatever it is, she is known to be a sinner. Does not say she's repented of that sin. Doesn't say that she's changed her lifestyle. What it says is she is she is so overwhelmed and overcome when she hears that Jesus is somewhere near her, she wants to go and seek him out. And she goes and she spends what money she has or, or just a bunch of money. She gets this expensive jar and this expensive perfume and she sneaks in where he's at and she wants to anoint his feet. And as she's doing it, she's crying because she's so deeply hurt. Forget the fact that she's immoral because that's what this passage does. This passage forgets the fact that, that she's this sinner. It doesn't make that the subject. What it makes the subject is her hurt and her pain and, and what that sin has caused in her life. And the man who invited Jesus, the Pharisee, he thinks, he doesn't even say, he thinks if this man was a prophet, oh, if he only knew that this woman is the sinner that she is, he would be so upset at this. He wouldn't allow this. He would, he would take care of this right now. And Jesus answers his thoughts. Jesus knows his thoughts. And Jesus says, let me answer that, but let me tell you a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one man and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave both of them, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more? After that, Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the first time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much more love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What an interesting story. Here Jesus is, here God is, forgiving this immoral woman. She hasn't even asked with her mouth. And he's answering this Pharisee's thoughts. How do you think he knows so much about the woman? He knows her thoughts too. He knows she's sorry. He knows she desperately wants forgiveness. She hasn't even said it. She doesn't speak in this entire story, but he knows. He intuits. It, it doesn't say, but we know that that's how this is working because here he is making this moral judgment of this, this woman. And he's speaking to her life. Even when he says her sins, he says, they're a bunch. He, he admits he's not justifying, he's not saying she's not sinful, he's not saying her sins are okay. What he's saying is, yeah, she's got a bunch, but man, it's taken a toll on her and it's hurt her and it's really wrecking her life and I forgive her. And then he points out all the things Simon didn't do that she did. Simon 
is, is thinking he's on equal footing with Jesus. Simon thinks he's the special one, but he neglected all the things that this immoral woman, this sinner did. Sometimes as churches, we, we forget the simple things. We look at the world, we look at all these sinners out there around us, and we say, you know what, we're better than them. We live life better than them. Yeah, we sin, but our sins are small. They're not super big. And, and in the process, we forget some very, very basic things when we're inviting Jesus into our homes, into ourselves, into our churches, whatever it is. And we neglect these simple things. And then here's Jesus. He's looking at us, the church, and we're not being loving and we're not being kind and we're not forgiving people when they aren't sorry. But then he's looking at all these people who are sinners and they are doing those things. What a, what a weird situation. Imagine having the entire church assembled to spread your message, but they miss the basics. And you're watching people who are just full of sin do some basics better than your kids. What a weird world we live in. What a weird time. What a strange era for the church. The church in general is not at its best right now. Some churches do great. They really do. They really get this and they really work at it. Um, man, we're trying. I know we don't get it perfect, but we are trying. And it just leaves me to wonder what is it? What is it about sin that we're so scared of? What is it about somebody else's sin that that's just so offends us and so makes us want to throw them out and move or move ourselves away from them? We're called to these people. We're called to love these people. We're called to go to these people. What is it? Jesus makes it really clear here. Don't get full of yourself. Don't. Don't think you're the one that's got it all figured out. If, if you're ignoring the basics, if you're, if you're not doing the things that Jesus has called you to because you're so religious and you're so good and you don't do this sin and you don't do that sin and you don't do that sin. And I would never associate with those sinners over there, those people over there. And don't for a second think that's not common in churches today. That is a, that is a common attitude. That is a common heart. And that is why so many people want nothing to do with the church. They want nothing to do with church people. And ultimately, they want nothing to do with Jesus because we don't represent him well at all. Now, that may all sound very discouraging, very doom and gloom, very, well, it's a bad situation. But here's the awesome thing. You don't have to do it. Your church doesn't have to do it. We don't have to do it. We don't have to fall into that same path. We don't have to look at this world and see sinners and say, ooh, no, uh, the last thing I want to do is be close to them. We can say, I have the thing that they need. I have the one who has saved me, the one that wants to save them, the one that doesn't need them to clean up every sin in their life before they can be saved. They can be saved before their life even starts to get cleaned up. And I have this gospel and I have this message and I can take it to people and I can give them hope and I can free them from the, the things that, that they're bound to. And in the process, I can become somebody that's all about what Jesus wants me to be about and has called me to be. And it's simple. It starts easy. It's the waitress at the restaurant that, that messes up your order. You're kind and you're patient. You say it's okay. And then you still tip her well. And you talk to her and you find out about her family. If you see uh, a picture of, ki of a kid in her, in her, the thing that holds the checks uh, and her tips, you ask her about her kid. You just, you make it clear to this, this, this woman or this man that you care about their life. It's, I'm in the grocery store and I run into somebody 
that man, this is the last person I wanted to run into. I say hi, and I ask them how they're doing, and I take a minute out of my day to try to love somebody that's unlovable. It's knowing I have a neighbor and I disagree with their entire life or their religion or their lifestyle or uh, all of these things. And it's, it's making a point of, of talking to them in the mornings when you're both walking to your car or, or getting to know the people around you and showing them how much you care about them. It's forgiving people even when they're not sorry. It's walking around this life and this world and our neighborhoods and our community, not with superiority, not with I'm so much better than everyone, but with such genuine humility that, man, my sins are messed up and Christ forgave me. And I'm so overjoyed at that. I just want to get him to other people. You don't have to go big. You don't have to be a foreign missionary. You don't have to go overseas. You don't have to, you can start with your neighbor. You can start with a waitress. You can start with a coworker. You can start uh, with a family member. You can forgive them even if they're not sorry. Even if someone's not sorry for their sin, you can forgive them enough to go near them and talk to them and love them and maybe introduce them to Jesus in a way that's going to get them to realize their sin is sin so that they're not saying sorry to you. They're saying sorry to him and they're seeking forgiveness from him and they're, they're bringing their lives to him. That's, I know I probably sound repetitive. I've been told, man, I repeat this a lot. It's because I, it's it. You can dig into scripture as much as you want. You can get to the depth of scripture as often as you want. But if you're not going out there and you're not finding ways to live your life for Jesus in the smallest of ways, it doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how many times you go to church or watch a video or read your Bible. If you're not going to take those things and put them into action, faith without action is dead we read later on. Just try it. Just try it. Love that unlovable. Love that sinner. Forgive people who aren't sorry. Walk around this world. Walk around your neighborhood. Not superior, but walk around really actively looking for people to love, people to forgive, people to form relationships with, people to strike up conversation, people to strike up friendships. That's what we're here for. We are here to take Jesus to people. And even before the word Jesus comes out of our mouth, everything in our life has the opportunity to show him, to show people exactly what Jesus is like, because that's how we're living. So that then when we talk about Jesus, they're like, that's why you act that way. And then they want to know, okay, I like you. So tell me more about this guy that you're exactly like. Try it. Just try it. If you get nothing else from these videos or from my messages or anything, I hope you get the encouragement of you don't have to go big. There are opportunities everywhere. All you have to do is see those opportunities and grab hold of them. And do something with your week that matters. Do something. That's how I'm living my life. I'm trying. I'm not great at it. I mess up all the time. But man, I'm trying. I'm trying to love people. I'm trying to forgive people. I'm trying to be more and more like Jesus. And if that's something you want, maybe we can help each other do that. And we can encourage each other to do that. And we can walk alongside of each other as we take Jesus in the, into this neighborhood or the, our community or our world. Or we can together keep each other encouraged and keep each other supported and keep each other strengthened through God's support and God's encouragement, God's strength. And we can just, we can go to sleep at night knowing that we spend our time and we spend our encounters and we spend our relationships doing something that matters. And not just something that matters, but something that matters for the kingdom, something that matters to Jesus.
Let's pray one more time. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for every opportunity this week that we're about to run into. Help us to help us to embrace every one of them. Help us to love people and forgive people and look for ways to be more and more patient. Help us to reach people. Help us to be the kind of people that pleases you. Help us to forgive people even when they're not sorry. Help us to turn the other cheek. Help us to do whatever it is we need to do to glorify you and bring more people to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, don't forget, we have started up our new midweek services. Monday nights is Young Adults at my house at 6 o'clock. John and Ray and Coulter run that. Tuesday nights, we have uh, Parents' Night Out. Drop your kids off at 5.30. We feed them dinner. We teach them about Jesus. We have a lot of fun. And then you can pick them up at 7.30, get them home in time for bed. But from 5.30 to 7.30, uh, you can go and run errands, have dinner, whatever it is uh, that, that you'd like to do for those two hours. Then on Wednesday nights, we have a Bible study for adults, and that's at 6.30. From 6.30 to 8, we're talking about Genesis and Revelation, and man, we are diving deep. Uh, but the rule of the Bible study is interrupt me. Uh, and, and that just means as we're going and as we're learning, the minute you have a question, the minute there's something that's been eaten at you or you don't understand, interrupt. And let's stop there and let's, as a group, really have an understanding of what's going on. We had a lot of people last week and I think everybody enjoyed it. Uh, so I would, I would highly encourage you to, to check that out. Uh, otherwise, I look forward to, to seeing you in service one Sunday or uh, just knowing that you're continuing to watch these videos. We will continue to do these videos as long as there are people who need them. Uh, so stay healthy, stay safe, and I hope you find this week encouraging and I hope you find people, that, man, they just, they need some love and they need forgiveness from a Christian who knows how to live like Jesus. Have a good week.